projects in our conservation lab. Each one should be about 20 minutes long. Um, the first one is about megalethoscope slides. The second one is about a Dolly Madison daguerreotype. And the third one is about Francesca Woodman's um, BFA thesis. And I'll talk about details as we go through the, the different treatments. So we're going to start with uh, the megalethoscope slides. The story begins in December of 2013 when the North Hampton Towns Heritage Commission asked Martha Cummings, a historic preservation intern from Plymouth State University, to take exterior and interior photos of the buildings on their municipal campus. Included in the survey was a 1907 original library, a Tudor revival now on the National Register, which is now used for various town functions. When Martha reached the attic, she found a cache of historical artifacts standing on end where an were an L L a lithoscope and a megalithoscope. Nearby on wooden shelves were stacked uncovered 14 photographs on curved wooden frames. Numerous people over the past 60 years had noticed the equipment. It was not, un not until an internet search turned up the George Eastman Museum blog post about megalithoscope slides and the images produced by the viewers. It was at that point Martha and the Heritage Commission realized that something had to be done. According to Cynthia Swank, a phone call to Todd Gustafson at the George Eastman Museum started the process. So what is a megalithoscope? The megalithoscope is an optical apparatus designed by Carlo Ponti of Venice before 1862. The megalithoscope is the evolution of the altheoscope patented by Ponti in 1861. In it, photographs are viewed through a lens which creates the optical illusion of depth and perspective. The albumin photographs are either backlit by an internal light source, usually an oil or kerosene lantern, or lit by daylight admitted via a system of opening doors. Ponti and others produce prepared photographs for the use in the megalithoscope. The photographs themselves were translucent and were colored and pierced to create dramatic visual effects, such as using backlighting to create the impression of nighttime. The first part of this webinar will show a multifaceted approach to the conservation and understanding of these lesser known photographic materials. First, by reconstructing or recreating a megalethoscope slide. Adapting new techniques from other specialties, such as mending procedures used for Japanese panel screens, and creating fills and in painting for the viewing in transmitted and reflected light. So we're going to start with the recreation. The FAIC Individual Professional Development Scholarship Award allowed me to spend two days with Mark Osterman, seen here on the right, photographic process historian at the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York, constructing a megalithoscope slide. There were no period instructions on how on making mounted megalithoscope slides. As a result, this tut tutorial was prim primary research into the construction of these unique objects. In addition, there's very little literature, almost none, about their history. So this experience provided a better understanding about these objects and, in turn, their future preservation and conservation. Prep work was done by Mark, creating a convex wooden frame from pine with handles. He bent it using steam. Prior to my arrival, a digital negative was created by Mark and his assistant, Nick, Nick Brandreth, also a historic process specialist. Mark also coated Strathmore, paper with albumin egg white. A second coating was added during my visit, and a double coating was added to strengthen the paper since the print was going to be stretched over a wooden frame. During the tutorial, we sensitized the papers with 20% silver nitrate and placed the negative and paper into a printing frame, which produced the albumin print for the construction of the slide. After exposure, the prints were rinsed to remove excess silver, gold-toned, fixed, and washed. And after a couple of trial runs, we had set we had set a set of final prints. And here you see um, downtown Rochester with the high falls. The morning of the second day, we viewed the slide collection in the George Eastman Museum Photography Department, examining how they were constructed, how the color was applied to the reverse of the photograph, 
tissue paper and how the pinpricks in the paper support were made. Luckily, one slide in the collection was damaged, which gave us the opportunity to view inside the slide and gain a little more insight into their construction. After examining the slides, the following course of action was taken. First, the backing or the dust cover was assembled using an open weave cotton cloth and Strathmore paper. The backings were lined together using wood starch paste and then hung to dry, as you see on the slide here. While the backing and dust cover were drying, the reverse of the photograph was painted with watercolors to aid in illumining the night scene. A separate sheet of tracing paper was substituted for tissue paper, which was used in some 19th century versions. The tracing paper was painted with gouache and added behind the print, providing more color and highlighting the night lights in the image. Pin pricks were set into the paper from the front of the image using a light table as a guide. It is these holes that become the lights and would illuminate the print during the night scene. Once the reverse once the reverse painting and pin pricking had been completed, the dust cover was adhered to the back convex part of the wooden frame using high glue and let to dry. A blue paper that covers the edges of the dust cover were replicated using a blue Korean paper called hanji and adhered with gum glue. The original paper tapes were possibly a thin paper painted with gouache, gouache or temp tempera. We tried to use original 19th century materials, but time and availability of resources was also part of our decision-making processes. In certain cases, 19th century megalethoscopes, colored tissue paper was used for the dramatic night effect. Here we created the effect by colorizing the back cover. The photograph was then attached to the concave or front part of the frame and adhered with gum glue along the edges. Black tapes on the front of the slide were recreated using strips of Apollo Renaissance paper painted with India ink and adhered along the edges of with gum glue. Our assumption was that the black paper tape was placed along the edges of the photograph for aesthetic reasons and also kept the photograph tightly stretched and properly attached to the wooden frame. And here you can see the final product. The ultimate test came when the completed slide was guided into the museum's viewer. And here we see T Todd Gustafsson, curator of Eastman Museum of Technology Collection, who set up the viewer for us and shifted the light on the slide so it could be seen transitioning from day to night. The slide fit, fit perfectly into the viewer. And once the slide was illuminated, there were a lot of wow shouted out by the staff in the study room. We only had time to construct one slide during my two-day tutorial. Additional materials were purchased for Mark to create one for the George Eastman Museum's collection. But now on to the conservation. The Northampton Heritage Commission brought eight megalethoscope slides to NEDCC. A total of 14 had been found, but funding could only secure to conserve eight of these slides. The scenes depicted were typical 19th century tourist scenes from Venice, Rome, Paris, Milan, Pompeii, Naples, and Jerusalem. The slides were very dirty with accretions and fly specks on the surface of the photographs. The albumin prints had yellow and faded overall with significant staining. There were numerous losses in the image area due to insect damage. Insect damage loss was also evident on the tapes and paper and cloth linings on the reverse. The photographer's paper supports were brittle and torn. The reverse paper and cloth dust covers of the two slides were badly torn and very weak, making some of these slides very difficult to handle. These slides had been stored in an attic and mentioned before were very dirty. Conservation treatment began with surface cleaning. Rubber sponges were used to reduce the surface dirt on the reverse along with the hockey brush. The rubber sponges were also used on the wooden frames. The photographs were surface cleaned with moisture and ethanol, and accretions were removed mechanically. The second issue was to address the stability of dust covers and paper supports. The blue tape, which had been used to hold the dust covers in place, were the most problematic, problematic and tearing along the edges of the frame, as you see here. 
The dust covers were also tearing along those edges. Here you see an example along the left edge of a slide where both the blue paper and dust cover are tearing. As a photograph conservator, I was used to mending two-dimensional objects. The added third dimension, dimension proposed the problem of getting behind the support to stabilize the tears. To stabilize the slides, we decided that the smaller tears and breaks on the paper supports were to be repaired in situ, and we needed to figure out how to mend the tears from the inside, and I'm putting inside in quotes. Mending techniques were adapted from those used from Japanese panel screens, usually mounted on wooden frames, where a piece of blotting paper with string is held in place behind the tear. This support or platform for mending the strips is held until the adhesive dries and the mend is secure. The technique does require cutting the string once the mend is complete, leaving the blotter, blotting paper inside the screen. Again, the technique was adapted and our approach was as follows. Using toned Japanese paper and Melanex strips were used as a platform as a support for the toned Japanese paper mends. Since many of the tears had occurred along the edges of the wooden frame, the strips were easily slipped in along the openings with the Japanese paper and wheat starch paste, wheat starch paste mend. Once dry and the mend was stable and well adhered to the dust cover, the Melanex strips were removed and the excess Japanese paper mend was adhered onto the wooden frame, holding the dust cover in its original place. In certain cases, depending on the fragility of the blue paper tape, it was lifted and the mends were added underneath. The Japanese paper mends were inpainted afterwards to blend more harmoniously into the surrounding areas. And then you can see on the left a before and on the right after slide. Two of the eight slides, one depicting El Duomo in Milan and a Venice scene, had dust covers that were extremely brittle, with silverfish damage severely torn and as a result difficult to handle. Since the town wanted to be able to project these slides, the approach was to line the most brittle dust covers and make them stable for handling. As they were there before as they were in their before stage. Handling them was precarious and the backing would easily tear. No strength was left in the paper and the cloth dust covers. The dust covers for Milan and Venice slides were mechanically removed from the respective wooden frames. The backside of the or the inside of the dust cover was lined with a remorseable lining, lightweight toned Japanese paper, in order to reduce staining, since they could not be washed. They were let dry overnight under moderate pressure and then rehumidified under Gore-Tex like material called Epic to prepare for attachment. Wheat starch paste was applied to the edges of the Japanese paper. The lined dust cover was stretched onto the reverse of the wooden frame, as you see in the slide. Moderate pressure and low heat from the tacking iron were used to ensure the lining would stay adhered and aid in drying. And again, here's before and after, the lining giving it a lot more support and is a lot easier to handle. Once the slides were stabilized, the aesthetic portion of the treatment began. India ink was used to inpaint the losses on the wooden frame. In painting, filling the losses of the photographic images were approached twofold because the slides were viewed in different lighting conditions. One part was done in daylight, and you see Amanda Maroney here on the left, and the other on the light table to ensure the transmissive quality of the slides. Losses to the paper support were filled with toned silver safe paper and or toned Japanese paper. Areas of loss in the photographs were in-painted using gambling conservation colors so the losses would blend in with surrounding areas. And again, before and after. It's also important to keep in mind when in-painting and filling losses an object like this to keep in mind the transmissive quality of the slides. See how the shimmering light is preserved. And the final steps in this project, um, here you see the, the, the hands of, of Jackie Scott on the left, uh, a former book conservation technician at NEDCC. She measured and created individual custom-made phase boxes for each slide. Each box was custom fit with E-flute 
board wedges and instructions provided for proper handling. These slides provided a conservation challenge and the opportunity to recreate a historic process. The multifaceted system recreating a slide, adapting two techniques from other specialties and aesthetic work carried out in different lighting conditions provided the basis for the conservation treatment of these slides. The recreation and conservation treatment of these slides provides us a better understanding of these objects and in turn their future preservation and conservation. And the North Her uh, Northampton Heritage um, Commission also had the viewer uh, restored and uh, I had the opportunity to view these uh, slides within the original viewer. It was pretty, it was pretty neat. Okay, so part two. I jumped ahead there. So finding a balance. Conservation of the Dolly Madison cased image from the Greensboro History Museum. So the idea of this title comes from an article by Grant Romer, who wrote, who wrote back in 1989, Guidelines for Administration and Care of Daguerreotype Collections. As we know, daguerreotypes differ from paper-based paper forms of photography. The most distinguished feature is its metallic composition. However, this material also makes the daguerreotype more vulnerable to marring, abrasion, tarnish, and corrosion. As a result, protective housing was a necessity. These protective housings also had a decorative function often elaborately wrought and forming elements of considerable aesthetic and historic value, integral to the entire artifact. The preservation of the daguerreotype package will also depend upon the integrity of the housing. The conservation treatment described in this talk discusses a standard method to stabilizing the Dolly Madison plate, but more importantly describes a unique approach to the conservation of the blue velvet case which houses the plate. Dolly Payne Todd Madison was born to Quaker parents on a small farm in the New Garden community of Guilford County. Dolly became one of her most beloved first ladies and the only one from North Carolina. She inspired citizens of her time and forged a legacy that other presidential spouses have sought to emulate. She was the wife of the fourth president of the United States, James Madison, from 1809 to 1817. She was noted for her social graces, which boosted her husband's popularity as president and earned acclaim as the most popular and inf influential woman in the capital city of Washington, D.C. In this way, she did much to define the role of the president's spouse, known only much later by the title of First Lady. Dolly Madison also helped to furnish the newly constructed White House. When the British set fire to it in 1814, she was credited to, with saving the Gilbert Stuart painting of George Washington. After James Madison's retirement from the presidency in 1817, Dolly and James returned to their Montpelier plantation in Orange County, Virginia. James Madison died in 1837, and Dolly returned to Washington City in 1844, where she had a significant presence in the capital. She knew all 12 presidents, having taken tea with George Washington, attended the inauguration of James Polk, and met Zachary Taylor. In her final years, she performed her most symbolic acts and received her higher, highest honors, sending the first private telegraph message and accepting her own seat in the House. During that time period, Matthew Brady made a conscious effort to capture the likenesses of the founding generation, and Dolly made that list. One of the two daguerreotype platens taken by Brady, the one you saw on the previous slide, and this quarter plate depicts Dolly Madison with her favorite niece, Anna Colston, who in her youth cared for Dolly in the last years of her life. Dolly died shortly after the daguerreotypes were taken on July 12, 1849. Why Dolly Madison? Why was she so famous and historically important? According to Catherine Algor, author of The Perfect Union, in a culture that had no place for women in the political spotlight, and in which only public women were prostitutes, Dolly was undeniably a public woman. 
She became a national figure when the United States was barely a nation, and only men such as George Washington occupied a place in the pantheon above party politics. And most inexplicable of all, Dolly proved herself a powerful political player in an age when women were excluded from politics. After Dolly's death in 1849, the bulk of this collection was inherited by her son, John Payne Todd, and upon his death sold at auction to Dolly's niece, Anna Coston, who you'd seen in, seen in the daguerreotype, and her husband, James Coston, Jr. The collection passed to their daughter, Mary, who married into the Kunkel family, and then to her son, John Baker Kunkel. After John Baker Kunkel's widow died in 1956, John Hafner was hired by a local lawyer to clean up the Kunkel house. The lawyer advised him to look, for, look out for items of historical value as John Baker Kunkel was the grandson of Dolly's favorite niece. When he was almost finished cleaning, Hafner brought his mother for a tour, and while showing her the bedroom, he noticed an envelope dating to 1832 sticking out from behind a panel. Remembering what the lawyer had told him, he immediately opened the panel and discovered a leather trunk full of Dolly and Jay Madison's possessions. He, his mother, and his sister completed an inventory of the items in the trunk and then sent them to the Allentown Bank for safekeeping, including two Matthew Brady daguerreotypes. As news began to spread about the discovery, Eleanor Fox Pearson of Greensboro expressed interest in seeing the Madison materials. During a trip to Allentown, she viewed the collection and resolved to acquire it. She formed the Dolly Madison Memorial Association and the group raised $10,000 to purchase the collection, which was donated to the Greensboro History Museum in 1963. Because of the object's provenance, the photographer who captured the image and its historical context and figure, probably one of two photographs taken of Dolly Madison, this cased image is an important piece in the museum's collection and was in real need of conservation. The cased image arrived via courier at NEDCC in a clamshell, clamshell box in the spring of 2016 for examination and conservation treatment. When it arrived at NEDCC, it was housed in a case that was structurally compromised. The plate was sitting very loosely within the case, and it was difficult to handle. We started with the stabilization of the daguerreotype plate, which included the following. Placing the daguerreotype plate in a custom Z tray made from a polyester sheet that was made to prevent the plate from moving in the case and to provide protection from the brass mat. And here you see images of the Z tray holding the daguerreotype plate. So the bottom left is the Z tray close up, and on top you can see how the daguerreotype sits in this Z tray. There was no brass preserver, and in order to reseal the daguerreotype package, we toned the filmoplast P90 into pachi colors, essentially watercolors from Japan, to color similar to the brass of the original preserver. Use the gold color of the tapachi and mixing it with a bit of Winsor Newton Indian Red to get the tone closer to the warm brass mat. The cover glass was replaced with a more stable silk more stable borosilicate glass, a labware glass, and then sealed with the toned film, filmoplast P90. Prior to sealing the daguerreotype package, notes were taken about the plate marker, any edge markings noted along the back edge, and noted along the back edge of the tape in pencil. Once the plate had been stabilized, it was put back into temporary housing, waiting for the case to be conserved, which is really the star of this presentation. Um, and the conservation treatment for the case was done by Tara Huber, who is um, uh, assistant book conservator here at NEDCC. As mentioned at the title slide, the conservation and preservation of daguerreotype case is just as important as the plate itself. The preferred cases for daguerreotypes in the United States grew out of the tradition of portrait miniatures. 
These small encased paintings were usually executed in gouache, watercolor, or enamel, and developed out of the techniques used to paint miniatures in illuminated manuscripts. Popular among 16th century elites in England and France, portrait miniatures spread across the rest of Europe in the middle of the 18th century. The English style of portrait miniatures were exported to the American colonies, where it remained highly popular until the development of daguerreotypes and photography in the mid-19th century. Daguerreotypes were often called miniatures as well, and the similar size and delicacy of the medium allowed for an easy translation of wooden cases from portrait miniatures to daguerreotypes. The cases served to house and protect the vulnerable silver image surface. The daguerreotype plate, brass mat, and glass were, uh, were to help to hold together by the brass mat, and the, this package was placed in the tray of the case. The other tray held a velvet pad that served as a placeholder and also protected the glass. Cases were made of two shallow wooden trays hinged together and covered with cloth, leather, or paper. Union cases introduced in 1853 were made of an early thermoplastic formed from sawdust, pigment, and shellac that were pressed in heated, that were pressed in heated dyes to form relief designs. And you see that um, on the upper right of your slide. In the late 1840s, when Dolly Madison image was captured, luxury cases resembling books began to be manufactured. These could be made of paper mache inlaid with mother of pearl and floral patterns, or wooden cases covered with velvet, silk, Morocco leather, or imitation tortoiseshell. The velvet or the silk was often blue, red, or green, and may be plain, have stamp decoration, or have an object such as a cameo inset in the cover. The edges of the books Bookcases were gilt or painted gold to resemble an edge gilt text block and sometimes had clasps at the fore edge. The Dolly Madison case was housed in one of these book style wooden cases covered in blue velvet that had been stamped in gold. And although velvet covered book like cases were common, the gold stamp floor motif is a rare design. In accordance with this type of case, the walls of the trays were gilt, and two metal clasps held the case close at the fore edge. The trays were hinged on the inside of the spine with a piece of purple sheepskin. These thin, fragile materials had failed, and the structure of the case was severely compromised. The tail edge wall of the upper tray was loose. The spine edge of the wall of the lower tray had completely split, and there were small gaps between the break edges of the wood. The detached spine edge was still hinged to the upper tray, but the leather hinge, um, but the but the leather hinge um, had detached. The detached spine was still hinged to the upper tray spine, but the leather hinge was very fragile and had several splits. The head and tail edge walls of the lower tray were missing. A previous attempt had been made to fill the missing lower edge with a tail edge with mat board. The loose tray walls were re-adhered with fish glue and clamped while drying. The edges of the split wood were well worn and there were many gaps between the two pieces. An adhesive that could form a secure bond while filling losses was needed and the two-part paste epoxy aerodite 1253 was chosen. Aerodite 1253 dries to a mahogany color and can be sanded, carved, painted, and stained. Once mixed in a one-to-one -one ratio, the epoxy has about 20 minutes of open time and cures in about six hours at room temperature. The case was repaired by reattaching the cover and repairing the broken spine following the techniques used when rebacking a book. Hiromi 37 tissue was toned with acrylic paints and adhered to the upper tray under the lifted velvet with wheat starch paste. The loose velvet of the spine was adhered to repair the tissue. The spine repair tissue was then pasted under the velvet covering the upper tray. The tissue was not adhered to the wood spine itself, leaving a hollow that would allow the velvet to move away from the spine and potentially and avoid potentially damaging flexing when, the op when opening the case. 
all of the lifted velvet was put back down with wheat starch paste or Plextol B50, an acrylic, acrylic adhesive, in order to avoid ex ex excessive moisture exposure. The missing pieces of wood at the head and tail of the lower tray were replaced with water gilt balsa wood. Balsa wood was cut and sanded to match the size of the missing tray walls and coated several times with rabbit skin glue. French caulk was slowly added to warmed rabbit skin glue to form gesso. The gesso was applied in a number of layers to the balsa wood and then once dried was sanded to better match the lost profile of the tray. Bowl was prepared by mixing one part Armenian bowl with two parts rabbit skin glue. Numerous layers of bowl were brushed onto the tray walls and then buffed smooth. Gilder's liqueur was prepared with water, isopropanol, and rabbit skin glue and was used to re-wet the bowl during gilding. The tray walls were gilt with multiple layers of 23 karat gold leaf. Some breaks in the gold were left in order to better har harmonize with the worn gold of the remaining original tray walls. Once dry, the gold was burnished with an agate burnisher. Pinch pads were created for the head and tail edges of the lower tray using book cloth and were adhered with Plextol B500, as were the original velvet foredge and spine edge pinch pads. The daguerreotype package was placed in the lower tray and the velvet cushion was adhered to the upper tray with Plextol. Here are before and after treatments of the Brady daguerreotype and its case. And there are some after images of the case, one showing the replacement of the, tra replacement of the tray wall and the opening of the case. Tara did some beautiful work with this, with this case. The daguerreotype by Matthew Brady of Dolly Madison and Anna Coston was part of Saving Washington, the inaugural exhibition of the new Center for Women's History at the New York Historical Society Museum and Library in March of 2017. Quoting the New York Times article, the title is a nod to Dolly Madison's famous rescue of a portrait of George Washington from the White House during the War of 1812 before the British arrived and burned the place. But it's also a metaphor for the complex ways that American women, well-born, ordinary, free, and enslaved, helped, as the show curators Valerie Paley put it, enact the Constitution on the ground. Okay. Looks and so our third conservation treatment today is something a little more, more, more contemporary. And it's Francesco Woodman's BFA thesis, Conserving a Work of Art for an Active Archive. Um, it's part of the Fleet Library, which is um, on the campus of the Rhode Island School of Design. Francesco Woodman was born in April of 1958 in Denver. Colorado. Her parents were artists. Her mother Betty was an accomplished uh, sculptor and art teacher. Her father George a painter and photographer. Francesca attended public schools in Boulder, Colorado and in 1972 began high school at Abbott Academy and here in Andover, Massachusetts. This is the oldest private school for girls in New England and actually where NEDCC also got its start. It merged with the Boys' School Phillips Academy during Woodman's second year. It was here that she began developing her photographic skills and learning about the art form. She graduated from Boulder High School in 1975, and after graduation from high school, she came back east and attended the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, in Providence, Rhode Island. Woodman moved to New York City in 1979, where she tried to make a career in photography by sending portfolios of her work to fashion photographers um, 
In the summer of 1980, she was an artist in residence at the McDowell Colony in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Woodman suffered bouts of depression and mental, mental illness throughout her life. Her first suicide attempt was in the autumn of 1980. She survived, received psychiatric treatment, and moved in with her parents who were also living in Manhattan. During that year, she had a string of bad luck. A grant application was denied, her bicycle was stolen, romance continued to turn sour, and her parents suspected she'd stop taking her medication. And on January 19, 1981, Woodman jumped from the roof of a building on the east side of Manhattan. Nobody at the scene knew Woodman's name. Woodman was largely unknown during her lifetime. The powerful and poignant body of the work she created is made more so by its scarcity since she did take her own life in 1981 at the age of 22. Her work was first introduced to the public during an exhibition at Wellesley College in 1986, five years after her suicide. At the time, much significance was attached to the autobiographical qualities which continue to intrigue audiences today. In recent years, there's been a resurgence of interest in Woodman's work, with ex exhibits at the Guggenheim Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which exhibited Blueprint for a Temple, a Diezo collage composed of 29 sections, and a 2010 retrospective at the Palazzo del Regione in Milan, Italy. A feature-length documentary, The Woodmans, directed by C. Scott Willis, was released by Lorber Films in 2010. To quote Elizabeth Gumport, um, the long exposure of Francesca Woodman, but what accounts for the current wave of interest in Woodman? Why do young artists in particular consider her a rock star, as one photography professor puts it in the movie The Woodmans? A note Woodman wrote on the edge of an early print perhaps provides a clue. There is the paper and then there is the person. Self-portraits once a challenge are now the easiest kind of images to produce. We, face, we just face our laptop and it snaps a picture or records a video. In this position, taking photographs feels exactly like not taking photographs and being recorded is just like being. We sit back or type or wander away. We are increasingly unable to register the creation of an image as a particular event and many pictures we are and, and many and many of the pictures we see are as unmemorable as the circumstances in which they were created. Perhaps this is why Woodman, who produced in her entire life fewer pictures than are uploaded to Facebook every second has been late has lately been attracting our attention. Woodman often planned her pieces far in advance, sketching them as a painter might, and in her journal characterized one of her long exposures as a portrait of legs and time. Because of Francesca's rock star status, her thesis was and is a favorite piece among RISD students, and access to the object is in high demand. In 2006, Andrew Martinez, archivist at the Fleet Library at RISD, bought, a Fran bought Francesca Woodman's BFA thesis to NEDCC, as it was becoming increasingly difficult to handle and was in desperate need of conservation. However, there was no funding to pursue it at this time. As you can see in the slide, it's composed of a lightweight tissue paper support, about 30 inches and 20 inches, and 21 3 and a half by 5 interpositive transparencies. The tissue paper was heavily anointed with ballpoint pen inscriptions. The piece was inherently quite fragile, and after 40 years in RISD's Fleet Library archive, the tape had become discolored and fallen off. Almost all of the transparencies had detached and were lying loose in the storage box, and the residual adhesive had locally yellowed the paper support. In addition, the thesis had been folded multiple times to fit into a 9 by 12 gray mailing envelope with a photographic self-portrait attached to the reverse with pressure-sensitive tape. The object had been folded up and placed in the gray envelope you see here and sent to her professor at RISD, Wendy McNeil. The stamp date on the gray envelope is February 24, 1979. Because of the resurgence of, of her work, 
The conservation project got the green light in early 2015, and the approach was twofold. To preserve the thesis' original essence and provide safe access to the object for the researchers and RISD students, working closely with the archivist, Francesca's thesis was stabilized by treating the original tapes, the tissue support, and re-adhering them to the transparency. And this is where we begin our story about conserving Francesca Woodman's BFA thesis. The first question we asked Andrew was regarding the placement of the transparency on the lightweight paper support. Placement of the negatives had been decided upon by Andrew Martinez, providing us with a CD of images and what the correct or intended placement was for the transparencies. The tape stains also left distinctive patterns um, on the, the tape stains also also left distinctive patterns on the transparency and paper support, which aided in the placement of objects. If there was any discrepancy, Andrew was always consulted. Each transparency and respective piece of tape was assigned a number, collated and placed in archival enclosures, and were kept safe during treatment. The pressure-sensitive cellophane tapes were an integral part of the piece. Where Woodman had purposefully placed the tape was an importance to the authenticity of the thesis. Unfortunately, the adhesive had crosslinked, and as a result, the carriers and transpar transparencies had detached. Some tapes were missing. Aesthetically, the yellowing had disfigured the paper support and transparencies. A variety of solvents were tested, and it was determined that local application of acetone would reduce staining and remove the adhesive. And here you can see a before and after, after local application of acetone. The staining was also evident on the paper support. Um, adhesive reduction could not be done mechanically since the paper support was fragile. Again, acetone was the solvent of choice since it worked effectively, evaporated quickly, and did not cause problems with staining. The staining was reduced on a suction plate, as you see in the slide here. It was especially important to work locally, as the ink used to write the inscriptions on this piece were highly soluble on acetone. The staining was greatly reduced, though not completely removed. The adhesive on the transparencies were also reduced, again using a local application of acetone. And after testing and finding a suitable archival adhesive, Plextol B500 was used, was applied using a brush on both the original and replacement carriers. Some of the original tape carriers were missing, and replacement carriers were created from 2 mil melanex, which is a similar th thickness to the tape even ripping the edges of the melanex on the tape dispenser, which was M Amanda Maloney's idea. You had seen her back um, at the megalethoscopes in order to recreate the edges of the original tape. The tapes and transparencies were then re-adhered to the tissue support, dried under holytex blotters and weights. The tissue paper was not flattened since the folds in the paper were original, created by the artist. Andrew wanted the folds and creases to remain evident to the piece. However, small tears in the paper support were mended with a lightweight Japanese paper and dry sweet starch paste. This aided in handling the piece. Even after treatment, handling and display poses certain risks to the object. Due to Woodman's fame and the uniqueness of this piece, it is frequently requested by students and researchers at the Fleet Library, and finding a safe way to allow access was an important aspect of this project. It was determined that a high-quality inkjet facsimile print would be made to scale and stored with the original object, and depending on the nature of the request, could be used in place of the original. Images using both transmitted and reflective light were taken to get the most accurate representation of this object. David Joyle, senior photographer at NEDCC, took care of all the imaging aspects of this project. In addition to a scale reproduction of the whole piece, high-resolution digital images were made of the individual transparencies before they were reattached. A facsimile of the piece was also created. 
This allows appreciation of each image with a depth that could otherwise not be possible. And you see an example here um, of one of the facsimiles. A customized housing was, was created for the thesis to minimize handling and to make it easily accessible to RISD students. The original and facsimile were stored together in a custom drop front box made out of blue board. In this slide, you see the facsimile on the right and the original on the left. Of course, in this image, they're completely indistinguishable. But I will say, even in person, the level of detail that was able to be rendered in the facsimile was quite impressive, even capturing the creases and folds, creating a trompe l'oeil effect. The original facsimile were each individually housed in polyester L-sleeve and then cornered into the archival corrugated boards for support. We experimented with a few different designs of reusable corners. We wanted to make sure adequate support was provided for the object and that the design was straightforward to minimize user error. We settled on a design with a tab that could be folded under the lock, the corner folded under to lock the corner down using a heavyweight Renaissance paper. In the bottom of the box, a sink mat was made to house the original envelope and two loose transparencies. The mailing envelope was left untreated per the request of the archivist at the Fleet Library. While the paper support and tapes adhered to the envelope are poor, poor quality materials, they do not pose an immediate risk, and it was seen as more important to preserve as much of the artifactual value as possible. The envelope was simply placed in a silver safe folder, and the loose transparency in the paper, individual paper envelopes, and then in a four-flap enclosure. Wood Woodman's thesis piece is inherently quite fragile, consisting of a supporting, consisting of a support thickly covered with transparencies that are heavy and stiff in comparison with a diaphanous tissue. I can't help but want to draw an analogy between the artist and his, this work. So outwardly bold and assured, but built upon an inner fragility which threatens destruction and yet is deeply integral to the work. This analogy is heightened by the poignant but current, currently illegible writing that is, exists throughout the work like a secret message waiting to be decoded. There is some clearly visible writing on the object, too. The letter to advisor in the upper left corner offers an interesting view into the conflicting attitudes of boldness and insecurity, honesty, and the fantasy that define Woodman and her work. Woodman writes, Dear Wendy, as you can see, this is finishing school with a whimper and late besides. I kept hoping time would be found to at least print them better. Then I kept thinking I'd call you and get an extension and could print them and reshoot them, but I'm beginning to understand that I can't have my conscience bothering me about school when I have to get on with so many other things. However, these awful prints made on a flat, follicular European codolith from often fogged, strangely focused negatives and not very inter interesting subjects are sort of interesting to me. I think that it was a real strange point for me. When I was in Europe, I kept trying not to think so I wouldn't worry about the future, moving to New York, looking for work, etc. So they are limbo pictures, end quote. I like that final phrase, limbo pictures and hope that our conversation treatment preser preserves the ephemeral, uncertain, and fragile aspects of the work while helping it survive into the future. Um, I want to say thank you for all your kind attention. And I also want to just go through some acknowledgment, acknowledgment slides. Um, because any project involves more than one person and requires collaboration. Uh, with the megalethoscope slides, uh, this project was certainly a collaborative effort. Thank yous to FAIC, which helped fund the recreation part with Mark Osterman, Cynthia Swank for her enthusiastic support of this project, Mark Osterman and Nick Barranth at the George Eastman Museum, and the interdepartmental work done at NEDCC with my colleagues and coworkers. Amanda, David, Jackie, and Michael. 
And a shout out to Tara Huber for the Dolly Madison case image, the wonderful work she did on, on the case. Elise Allison, the archivist at the Greensboro History Museum with whom we consulted. And my co-workers at NEDCC, Michael Lee and Todd Pattison. And acknowledgments also, we'd like for the Francesca Woodman's BFA thesis, uh, we'd like to thank Andrew Martinez for his enthousi enthusiastic engagement with this project and for supporting the presentation of it to you all today. To David Joyle, whose imaging expertise was essential to the successful completion of this project. To Michael Lee, Terence Ambrosio, and Suzanne Gramley for all their helpful support and advice. So. If you have any questions and you want to type them in, I'd be be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, April. Okay, and um, if there aren't any questions, you know, if you have any, I should have put my meal, email up here. Um, but if you have any follow-up questions, if you if you think about it, okay. Vicky writes about how long did each project take to complete? Um, I would say a couple of months from start to finish. Um, you know, since you're working interdepartmentally. You know, the workflow does sometimes slow down between each department. Um, so I would say a couple of months. The work itself is a couple of hours, but you need time to, to process these things, think about these things. Um, Okay, Beth is typing. And Beth writes, for anyone who has access to the canopy through their public library, the Wisdom documentaries available. Yes, I think I saw it on Netflix, and it was it was very very interesting. Um, I have to, I have to say. Um, so if you think of any other questions, um, you can always email me, and my email is m for Monique, and Fisher is f i s c h e r. And uh, at NEDCC.org. And I'm going to write it in the chat box. OK. Thank you very much. And uh, 